Om Shanti. When we are looking at the subject of how karma and drama work together in the context of an, an event, an occurrence of this nature, then we're not talking theoretically, but it's really practical. I think that we will see more like this. Because the world is passing through very difficult times. We might even say entering into even more difficult times. And this is the reason why we have been given spiritual wisdom so that we know how to handle it, how to interpret it, how to be with it. When something like this happens, we would say it is drama. And then after that, the question arises, what is the karma involved? We need to know both these things. There are many energies involved. There is the energy of destiny. I remember many years ago I was in Bosnia and um, I was interviewing a man who had been living in the front line in um, Sarajevo during the siege. And it was maybe 10, 15 years after. And I was asking him how he was now, how he managed it. And he was telling me that he stayed there, but he didn't take up a weapon. And he was always worried throughout the siege that the army would find him and... Um, conscript him and force him to take up a weapon uh, but he didn't want to take a weapon and he managed to avoid conscription and just stay there in the siege and he saw many things that no human being should ever see and um, at the end of the interview he said that he thought that it was destined, that there was no way that that siege and that war could not have happened, and that you had to make your peace with it once it's over. And that's a very deep understanding, because the, the drama of this world contains a lot of wonderful things and also a lot of tragedy. And we who are part of this drama, we have to, um, we have to manage that because there are very difficult things to have to manage. And tragedy is one of them, it's part of life. Death is part of life. Um, in some ways, we'd have to say brutality is part of life. If you are in the, the jungles of Africa where there are lions, and gazelles, kudu, giraffe, wildebeest, you know, the nature of the jungle is 
there's predators and there's prey. And it's the nature. In nature, a lioness will kill one big animal and she will eat and her family will eat. And then come the other animals and finally the vultures. And then that animal will be the food for quite a lot of the food chain. A human being kills just for death. So it's different. It's not the law of the jungle. The law of the jungle makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more reasonable, economical. When human beings engage in large-scale killing, it is a strange phenomenon, but it is there. And so we would say, it is drama. You have those who are killed, and you have those who perform the act of killing. And if you ask yourself, which is better, to be the killed or the killer? Neither is good. And there is karma between the killed and the killers. And this karma um, moves on through many generations. It is a hard thing for people to work with, to accept, to deal with this relationship when it comes to war. And yet it is so much part of the human experience. And at the present time, I think there may be more than 40 or 50 wars going on as we speak in different parts of the world. A few of that comes on the news, most of it doesn't. So we are in very difficult times. We are in times where the human population is too big. And many of the human problems are because there is too much population. And we can't say, although people do say, okay, well the best solution is we have to remove some people, but which people? So you have different um, ethnic cleansings. But yet, every soul who leaves the body naturally or by some uh, brutal and untimely way, they reincarnate, they come back. So, you can't reduce the population like that. It doesn't work. So what should we do? How should we feel about each other? You know, this spiritual wisdom is given to us during times of great trial in the human history, the human civilization. And we are at a time when there is great instability and where the, the forecast is not so good. And so, you know, I remember for many years I was in the news business, so I know many things are not told to the public because it's too heavy. And um, now more and more heavy things are told, but still many heavy things are not told. So here we are. How do we feel? What do we do? What do we think when we are in the face of such things? We are taught to be soul conscious. And that means we have to think about ourselves as immortal and all of our brothers and sisters 
in whichever race or culture or religious a denomination they may be. All are our brothers and sisters. And so a spiritual practice is to have no hatred for anyone. Even though we may be surrounded by those who hate one set of people or another set of people enough to kill them. And why do people do that? We would say, well, ultimately, destiny. If you take it to just an individual level, the small battlefield of life is a family. And in one of the lessons, one of the murlis that was told to us quite some time ago, it was said that in every family on earth, there is at least one person who is suffering intensely. Maybe through illness, maybe through the dysfunctional family relationships. But the human family is the microcosm of the large human family. And I think that usually, individually, we feel quite powerless in the face of large human conflicts. But each and every one of us is in the context of our family. It may be our biological family. It may be your professional family, the family of people that you work with. It may be your spiritual family, the family of those that you come together with for spiritual practice and study. There are many configurations of family. But in every family, there are conflicts. And in this BK family, which is quite a big family, I think that uh, for BKs we are more than one million. Still we say this is a family. And we come together in centers and small groups or big centers. And we uh, look at something that we call the clash of sanskaras. So the clash of sanskaras is a very interesting topic to look at because each and every one of us, if you think about it, there is someone or other in your connection with whom you, you come easily into clash or through whom you may take sorrow or experience being disenfranchised or diminished or somehow um, removed from your true sense of self. So this is a context that we could consider as an exam. And what is the test? What are, being, what are we being tested on? And um, why, why is there so much pain? Why do we take sorrow? How do we take sorrow? What does this all mean to us? And uh, how can we use our spiritual strength, our spiritual practice to transcend such a uh, difficult reality, such a phenomenon that we can't really avoid. We may try to run away from it, but it follows us like our shadow. So eventually we have to turn around and face it and see what is this, you know. When we talk about conflict of sanskara or clash of sanskara, we can also say clash of ego. And um, my uh, interpretation of ego is uh, it's a mask which we use to cover the self which is so um, depleted or so uncertain of itself that it doesn't want to be seen. And so it makes a mask. 
and says, this mask, this is me. See my mask, don't look at me. And we fuse with that mask and we say, I am this mask. And in our spiritual terminology, this is what we mean by body consciousness. When we are fused with our mask, the ego mask. So anytime anything will attack, or that we perceive to be an attack on our mask, we take that as an attack on me, uh, we take sorrow, we have a, a reaction, an ego reaction, an ego defense behavior or position. And so we do that. And we do that in the microcosm of our small family circumstance. And it goes to the macrocosm of the different conflicts that are there in the world. And so in the knowledge that we study, we have to really deal with this because we cannot be free. Nobody can be free unless we work through this. And so this is our exam. Ego is a difficult thing because you can see somebody else's ego, but you can't see your own ego very easily. And because of this reason, um, we tend to justify going against the ego of someone else. And we think that when we take sorrow, that that is um, just the way it is. You, you don't have any option. But let us look for a moment at this question of taking sorrow. Because in our teachings, it is said to us many times, an instruction is given to us, do not take sorrow. I see. So, um, easier said than done. But I look at this question of taking sorrow quite deeply and to see if it's possible to actually live without taking sorrow. And uh, I came to some conclusions which I found very useful for myself. And one of them is to do with the definition of sin. Sin being whatever you do which is not okay. So my conclusion has been that there are three kinds of sin. One kind which everybody knows about is that you shouldn't do things which are harmful to other people. And usually we know that we shouldn't do this. So these are sins of commission, something you do that you shouldn't do. Something that your conscience tells you you shouldn't do, but you do it anyway. Something that your um, external moral authorities have trained you that you shouldn't do. It's in all the scriptures. Don't kill, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. And so those are the sins of commission which get done a great deal, different crimes. Then another kind of sin is the sins of omission. So a sin of omission means that you didn't do what you're supposed to do. And because of that, you accumulated minus points in your karmic accounts. It is less easy to um, identify when you didn't do something that you should do than when you did something you shouldn't do. Because your conscience bites a bit more. But I've spoken before about the conscience. It's a very reliable instrument to let you know, hey, that wasn't okay. So when you don't do what you're supposed to do, some of it is because you just don't know how to love. You don't know how to fulfill the obligations of relationships because of lack of information, a lack of practice, or lack of a, a functional social environment. 
But the third kind of sin is um, taking sorrow. And um, that's not normally classified as a sin, but I like to classify it as a sin because of some particular reasons. When you take sorrow from someone and you think about it and you take in pain and you amplify that pain and you hurt yourself and you feel resentful and you may want to take revenge or you may actually take revenge. This energy of taking sorrow actually does the same damage to us as when we give sorrow or as when we are supposed to do something that we don't do. And so because of these reasons I classify uh, taking sorrow as a sin. And so there are many, many situations which give sorrow and we naturally take sorrow. So if we want to not take sorrow, then how do we do that? Because in our training over all of this life and maybe many other lives, we never thought that taking sorrow was optional. We never classified it as sinful to take sorrow. We thought it's normal. If somebody gives me sorrow, I take sorrow. That's normal. But the instruction that we get, we say it's an instruction for the, from the divine. So if the divine says to me, don't take sorrow, then I have to think about it. That Okay, why not? What's this all about? What is the deeper meaning of it? And along with that, we are given this um, concept that everything that happens to us personally or that we know about or that happens in the world, it is in the drama. And the drama is something that is made up of happiness and sorrow, victory and defeat, success and failure, all these different opposites. So in the scripture of India called the Gita, it is taught that a person who is practicing spirituality needs to reach a point of being uh, neutral or equal in the face of the pairs of opposites. So if something's a little bit good or a little bit bad, it's not that difficult to be equal. But as time goes on, things become, you know, much more polarized. And what we find is there's a lot of things that occur to us uh, which are very bad and we take sorrow from them. And so how, how are we going to interpret this instruction that it is what it is. It is in the drama. You have to accept it. So you have to accept the unacceptable. What makes it unacceptable? What makes it acceptable? So one of the issues that we have to deal with is that I, the self, in many cases, am not strong enough to manage what's happening. So one thing is to strengthen the self, to be able to manage it. And um, every, every person experiences tragedies in life and the reason that we experience these tragedies, it is said in our teachings, is to become experienced and to become strong. A few years ago, I had been to the Philippines immediately after the um, hurricane or the cyclone, which was called uh, Haiyan, which had destroyed um, 
very, very serious destruction, very, very big destruction. And I had gone there maybe a month or so afterwards. And uh, and the people were asking me, okay, why did this happen? And why were we not informed of the nature of a storm surge? Because it, most of the deaths occurred because although everyone was warned that there will be a storm surge, they didn't know what a storm surge was. A storm surge is that the sea level rises a lot and anybody who happens to be there will be killed. And so the place where they took refuge was on the edge of the coast in a sports stadium which was completely drowned. And um, so there were resentments and it took a long, long time to um, put the place back together. Actually, it's still not back together. But anyway, this was called Takloban. Um, I found myself saying to people that this teaching that we had had, the reason this happened is to make us strong and to make us experienced. And because we are now facing many, many things which are difficult, whether it's in our own private family environments or in our cities or in our countries or in our uh, hemisphere or in the whole world, there are many, many things going on which are intensely disturbing. And because we are going through big change, climate change, doesn't matter what you do, you can't stop it. Doesn't matter what you do. You have to deal with it. Sea levels rising, yeah, temperature variables, a problem in agriculture, it is like that. Financial instability, so many things. Terrorism coming more and more. Events like the one today is happening. What do we do? How do we do this? I think one very important piece of work to do is to not take sorrow. Because when we take sorrow, we become seriously weakened and we're already not quite strong enough to manage it. So we should not reduce our strength. That is one thing I think is important. We need to be able to embrace the unembraceable because it's there. I, see. I think it's very important for us to know that the souls cannot be destroyed. So anything that happens to anybody, they'll be back. No one can get lost. This is a very important thing to inculcate into ourselves, that whatever happens, no one can get lost. But also, we must be very clear to um, make our lives Simple. Simplicity is a very effective weapon against the unexpected. Make our lives clean and simple uh, because there's, uh, it takes less energy, there's less things to look after. Um, I think it's also very important to have good faith. Good faith in the self, good faith that whatever is going on, it doesn't mean that God is responsible for all of these horrible things, because people say, where was God when this was happening? As if God is supposed to be preventing these catastrophes. Many people think like that. But then God will say, 
No, these things do happen time to time. And it's not up to me to prevent them. But it's up to me to show you how to get through them. That is actually more what he says. So how do we get through it? We have to build our resilience. We have to build our capacity for these things. And we have to not lose faith in humanity. Because sometimes when things get really bad, you have a, a moment, or maybe a long moment, we just lose faith in humanity, and that is a mistake. We should not do that. So in, in uh, Raj Yoga, we are taught to have something called power of accommodation, to be able to accommodate people's bad behavior and still get through, still keep ourselves in one piece, you know. Because these, these bad things that happen, they can break us. But they can also become an instrument for us to transcend our limitations and get past that and come more in contact with our greatness and become instruments for, you know, getting all of humanity to get past this period of um, catastrophic occurrences because we are facing these things. And in some ways it's taboo because people don't really think it's a good idea to talk about it. Maybe it's bad luck or something. But on the other hand, it's important to be able to talk about it to be able to feel the intensity of the tragedy and still not be broken by it, and so that we can still move on and move through. Because all of these things, they persist for some time, but they don't persist forever. A time comes when it's over, and we just have to be able to get through all the way until it's quiet and rebuild and come back together. So these, um, these events of drama, we would say, okay, there is karma involved, but when it gets like this, very, very intense, very, very extreme, we need to move away from blaming. Otherwise, it's a normal thing in human psyche to f try and put a finger of blame and get revenge. Um, in, in law, you know, if, if somebody does a crime against somebody, they, they want justice. Justice means the other person has to be, has to pay. It's called justice. And um, it's a kind of bloodthirstiness in a sense. So uh, sometimes you get people who say, okay, I will let it go. The laws of karma stretch over a long, long period of time. And sometimes when something bad happens to someone, through someone, it can be considered as that was a settlement. Now it's settled. But you can't see it because it may be from another life. But you can feel it. But sometimes our emotions get in the way of these very subtle intuitions. So what we are taught at this present time, which we call the Confluence Age, we are taught that this present time is the time of settlement of karma. And in various different scriptures they talk about the time of settlement or the time of reckoning. And when it's the time of reckoning, 
there's a lot of payments going on. And so we can say, okay, there's a lot of payments going on. Now what is my position in the face of such things? When you meditate, it is said you are earning an income. So if you meditate a lot, then you earn a lot of income. And that income is not in dollars and pounds and rupees, but it's a different kind of wealth, which is personal spiritual strength. And that personal spiritual strength takes the um, form of an inner ability to manage catastrophe. You see, because if you're not strong enough, it breaks you. If you are strong enough, you can navigate it, you can get through it. And so what is advised to us is fill yourself with strength, massive amounts of strength, so that not only you yourself can get through your tragedies, but that you can also be a beacon of light that other people can say, well, if this one can get through, then I can also get through. You see? Because there are tragedies. And it's part of our process, part of our study as human beings to be able to work with this, to be able to get through it and to keep ourselves loving, pure, accepting, solid, strong, to be able to manage it and still go on. Uh, because it is through such a positioning of the self that something new can come out. Something new which is like a new birth of humanity, a new birth of civilization. And so it is that we are at a time when there is tremendous polarization and people get confused about it because I think many of us are using criteria and angles of approach for handling reality that worked fine up to, I don't know, a hundred years ago or so but it's not working anymore because the circumstances now are just different. It's much more intense, it's much more extreme. And so it means that we have to use different criteria to manage these things. Otherwise, how will we go through, you know? I mean, we know that there's nothing we can do about climate change and the severe upset that it is doing, which is not going to slow down, it's going to increase. Sea levels are increasing, cities will drown, and you can't just go somewhere else because it's not practical. So normally what we do is we just uh, forget about it. And um, when some big thing happens, then we try and get some compensation and we try and apportion blame and we finally have to deal with it. But it's becoming more and more difficult. And one of the reasons is because we're not strengthening ourselves. So in spiritual practice, we say, no, what we need to do is understand the difference between what we can do nothing about and what we can do something about. So what we can do nothing about, there's no point trying to do something about it because you can't do anything about it. What I can do, I can do something about me. I can do the work of taking down my ego, which is a big obstacle. I can do the work of intensifying my sense of love for humanity and not, I like these people and not those people. 
It's very important to be inclusive of all the races, all the religions, all the different types of people that there are because it's a human family and so I need to increase my heart to love. I need to be able to let go. I don't tend to use the word forgiveness. Um, I prefer the word let go. This is just me. Because things happen. People do something against you. But if you're strong enough to manage it, you can let go. If somebody does something against you, why do they do that? I would say, not because they're bad, but because they're weak. They're weak. Weak people do bad things. Good people do bad things when they're weak. All of us have moments of weakness. And if we make ourselves strong, then I think it's easier for us to let go of the impact of other people's weakness. That is more our greatness. If we keep going with the process of taking revenge, it's an escalation that knows no end. And the end of escalation is there will be nobody left. So that's not useful. So better is to make myself um, a different kind of person who um, uses different kind of cr criteria to handle things that are happening. So I have to go to my drawing board and rethink the architecture of my value systems, uh, my ethics, my morality, and um, decide how I'm going to operate as an individual. Because just as the microcosm of catastrophe is the family, as an individual, how will I function in my potentially dysfunctional family so that my karma is the best possible, even though the drama may be not very good. So it's only possible for me to do good karma if I really study about karma so I really know my stuff. And then I also have to have a lot of power, personal power, to do the right thing. It's very expensive to do the right thing. So you have to have a lot of money, spiritual money in the form of personal power to do the right thing. And of course other people will think you're nuts, but that doesn't matter. You just do the right thing, be right with your conscience, have the power to let go. And when somebody attacks you, do not allow yourself to be diminished by that attack. You have to be very creative to respond to that attack in a way to neutralize the situation because otherwise there's an escalation of predator and victim. And being a victim is not better than being a predator. And victims usually turn into predators anyway. So that's not a good arrangement. To neutralize these give and take of sorrow, we start by not taking sorrow. You know, if you think I'm absolutely horrible and stupid and blah, 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 you say, well, you have a problem. I am so nice and so interesting. Oh, sorry, you can't see it. You're not going to take sorrow like that, you see. It's just a way of turning things around so that you don't take what is put on you by someone who is in a habit of weakness. And so we have to be very strong, we have to be very creative, we have to study for this, and the circumstances that we are in are very helpful for giving us plenty of practice. So when you find yourself living with people who are specially designed to make you nuts, 
um, understand that there's a reason behind it, behind it and they are really there to help us to actually reach our fullness and then we'll be able to uh, manage all right. So whenever anything happens and you're looking at the karma of it and the drama of it, these are uh, two angles of approach that, you ne that need to work together because there's always karma involved, no doubt. There's an account, no doubt. But the attitude of saying, it's not good, it's not bad, it just is, is a very helpful attitude. Because you're not assigning it as a good thing or a bad thing, you're just saying, it is, it is like that. You're not pretending it never happened, it happened. It just is. And then, you kind of put a full stop, say, okay, that's what it is. Now, how am I going to be in front of that? What am I going to do next? What am I going to think, you know? And really uh, connect with the strength in yourself, the greatness, the qualities in yourself, and bring that into the situation. You, you adding value to a situation and you're changing the meaning of the situation into something that actually has significance and which can be made into a kind of fertilizer for your um, civilized state, you see, because you know, if you want to get really good roses, you need horse manure, isn't it? You have to fertilize these flowers with that. And it's like that. And so these things which we say are bad have a possibility of um, causing something good if we just can interpret it like that, if we can just see it, if we can just allow it to do its good work, it can. And the, the thing that we have to do, the change we have to make, is to actually empower ourselves and claim our power. And so in this situation, the usefulness of God is this. God will say, okay, I am the Almighty. I'm available, I'm accessible. All you have to do is plug in and take power. Because if you take power, you can handle this. If you don't take power, I'm not responsible. You know. We do not, we are not obligated to remain weak. We, we know better. We have all the information. Just we have to have a little patience and pay attention and observe ourselves. Especially you can try this out. How easily and how often we take sorrow, even just a little bit. This happened, oh it was really bad, really bad, really bad. Okay, then you say, okay, no, this happened. Okay, it's all right, I can handle it. So in Raj Yoga we learn about powers. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that from Sister Asha tomorrow, the powers and the virtues. Because these are the treasures that God will give us on the battlefield as our weapons. So sometimes we have to think of ourselves as warriors, spiritual warriors. Uh, we do not have a, a war against any other people, but we do have a war against um, stupidity, our own. And we have a war against not understanding properly and we have a war against not strengthening ourselves when we could. And we have a war against our own um, you know, inability to restrain ourselves when we should and could. 
you know. So for that we need weapons, and we have good weapons are offered. We have a good gun shop here, and um, the weapons, uh, spiritual weapons, are to be able to endure. So ask yourself, how great is my power of endurance? Um, we also have to be very flexible. And we also need a wonderful thing called the power of transformation. Someone hurls a rock at you and you receive it as a bunch of flowers. Thank you, that was nice. You didn't get hit, you didn't get hurt, because you understood how to catch it and change it into something that you receive as good. You're not taking sorrow, you're taking the deeper meaning behind it, which added something to yourself. This is skill. And uh, we can do this. So, now it's time for us to meditate on all this, is that right? So I'm going to ask my brothers to join me. So let yourself be comfortable. You can keep your eyes open or closed, it's all right. And just think for a moment of the most difficult, impossible relationship that you have. Just keep that person there in front of you. somebody that you just are unable to be harmonious with because it just never works. Um, we, we'll use the music of David. Thank you. So there you are with your favorite enemy. And just look into that person's eyes and say to yourself, from the depth of my heart, I give you full permission to perform your role as it is. And while you do that, just let go of your deep desire to make that person be other than they are. Just let them be. And retract yourself into yourself. Allow yourself to be a witness. Increase the distance between yourself and the sorrow you have taken from that person. And say to yourself, it was what it was. It's okay. Let it be. It happened, but it's not happening right now. Right now, I am me, 
and who are you? And all the strings of attachment that you have with that person, the ties that tie your mind to that person. Let those strings get loose and disconnect. And draw your sense of self into yourself. Imagine yourself to be in the center of a vast spherical cinema screen. And all these stories of the past and the present are like shadows and lights creating images on the screen. All these things exist in your mind. Because you perceive them in your mind. Things you see, things you hear, it's all perception. And it's up to you how you interpret perception. You say to yourself, all this is a film. There's romance, there's tragedy, there's comedy, there's a history, a mystery, There's the mundane, so many things. All these scenes, they rise, they persist for a while, sometimes a long while, and then they fade away. and you let them go. And something else arises. It persists for a while. You engage with it in the best way you know. And when it's finished, you let go. It was what it was. Every scene contains messages of wisdom. Whether it looks good or it looks bad, it has a message. One of the most powerful messengers is pain. So bring onto the screen of your mind one of the most painful scenes of your experience and look at it. See that scene. Know the pain that comes with it. Pain in your memory, pain in your subconscious. Just look at it 
and see it fade. Most of our pain is deeply buried. We don't like it. But it has important messages for us. As we become filled with spiritual strength, our pain rises to the surface. So we can see it, bear it, and ultimately love it. It has a very powerful message for us. To bring us to our strength. bring us to compassion, acceptance, whatever it was, it was. leaving a legacy of wisdom within you. It has a purpose. Then bring into your mind your most precious possession. person you love the most, the achievements, the places, the things that are most precious to you. you hold them to your heart. Love them intensely. And at the same time, let there be absolute detachment. Because one day they will go. One day they will turn against you. One day they will die. And when they do, they let go with love and detachment. You let it be, whatever it is, it's okay. And after all of that, you are with yourself. You will always be with yourself. And the most important is to be right with yourself. And all these experiences leave you the legacy of deep understanding and wisdom and the sense that everything is as it should be. It is what it is.
and you can become silent, still and loving. Love the whole world. Shut